Um, so about me, my name is uh, George Clifford Williams. You can email me at gcw at 8ions.com. Uh, the G in my name stands for George. I loathe the name George. So you can call me that if you like. I probably won't respond. Uh, I go by Cliff. Uh, live in Chicago, married, no kids, two dogs, love spoiling my nieces and nephews, um, I'm highly opinionated, practically agnostic means that when it's time to discuss the merits of something, I will gladly say what I think is the best solution, but when it comes to actually getting work done, it's not time for deciding anymore, so it's just time to get work done. Um, in my day job, I spend a lot of time consulting with clients uh, to put things in the cloud, to help them develop um, better CI CD pipelines. I do all the things that get labeled as DevOps, um, and I try to automate as much as possible. So, what I talk about here is all from the perspective of someone who, who digs deeply into uh, delivering packages to the cloud. So, understanding the problem. If you are a developer, or if you support developers by pushing out applications, typically someone's developing code, and they find an operating system to deploy it on, and everything works out perfectly, and there are never any problems. In dreamland. Um, this view of your application is not really tied to the real world. Um, a slightly more realistic view of it is that you have a kernel that your application will need services from. On top of that, you have a library of some sort that interfaces with system calls. You have your user land utilities, and then packages that get installed. And then finally, your application code gets deployed. Um, this, by the way, applies to posix -y type systems, Linux, Solaris, FreeBSD, the sort. Um, if you're on something that's not posix -y, then I'm sorry, what I say doesn't really apply to you. So, this is the way it really looks as compared to the kind of like loose idea of how your application deployment might work. So, if you get that uh, view set in, you write your code, you deploy it on your application, I'm sorry, you deploy it on your operating system, what happens when you need to upgrade? So if you upgrade your operating system, um, let's say, uh, can someone name an operating system or distribution that they use? Just for one out. FreeBSD. FreeBSD, okay. <laughs> so let's say you, uh, you deploy your application on FreeBSD, and then you need to do an upgrade. Uh, you could upgrade packages, you could upgrade your base operating system. Um, hopefully, everything goes well. But if it doesn't, your application may break in interesting ways. And when that happens, you might have to rework your code. Or, you might have to back out the upgrade. Now, why would it break? There could be conflicts with versions of libraries. Uh, there could be a security fix that forces uh, a change of some tool, um, or things could just get deprecated, which is pretty common. So, what if uh, your application isn't affected by an upgrade, but is affected by needing something different? Maybe a tool that conflicts with another tool, or a newer version of something that's already on your system. There's a chance that uh, you could use a private uh, repository. Uh, on FreeBSD systems, it's pretty easy to use the packaging system to say, go fetch this set of packages from another place. Similarly, on Red Hat or uh, Ubuntu, you can point to other repositories, add that into the mix of the repositories that you use to deploy your application, and hopefully everything will be fine. If it isn't, you could download and compile something yourself. In the enterprise, frequently Java is a requirement that people need to download uh, because there are specific versions that come with most enterprise uh, operating systems or distributions, and then your application may require a different version. So, uh, downloading and compiling yourself, it actually used to be the common way that people would de deploy applications, now it's rare. Um, alternati <laughs> alternatively, uh, if you're operating system has a maintainer for a particular package, you can reach out to them and say, hey, I need a new version of this. 
hopefully they'll get back to you. Sometimes they don't. Uh, if you're needing something that conflicts, uh, a good example of this is SSL. Uh, there are many SSL libraries out there. Everybody's starting to be more security conscious with the way that they develop applications, so TLS and SSL are pretty common. Your application may require a different version of a TLS library than what comes with your operating system. And that can cause problems. So one way to deal with that is with the Chirrut jail or containers, Linux containers, jails, Solaris zones, that kind of thing, or environment management, something like virtual env on Python, or if you're using a Java app, setting the Java home, Lua apps can use Lua path, the kind of thing that lets you uh, set a narrow focus for your application to find the tools that it needs. Um, alternately, you could just wait and hope that uh, whatever tool that you need becomes the prevalent tool for your distribution or operating system. And <clears throat> a consideration in all of this is how you're actually deploying your code. Um, it's not uncommon for people to write their code, tar it up, ship it over the wire with SSH or something, or put it on uh, like a Git server, go out to, to a machine, pull it down, and consider that a deployment. Uh, also, some people package their apps uh, in the native format for their operating system. So in FreeBSD, it would be a port. On Red Hat, it would be an RPM or a Debian on, I'm sorry, a Deb on uh, Debian and Ubuntu systems. Um, you could package it in the runtime for a language that you're building in. So if it's a JavaScript app, maybe it's an NPM, M, NPM package or a Ruby gem, a Lua rock, Python egg, et cetera. Uh, you could also do a make file. Um, Maven and Ant are really just fancy make systems, so you can specify where files should go. Ship that along with your tarball. Sorry, ship that along with your tarball, and hope for the best. Um, then there are kind of smarter tools for doing all of the above: um, Puppet Chef, Ansible Salt, Tivoli, Blade Logic. Um, they all do configuration management. Basically, take a set of files from here put them over there, and it's better than doing things by hand, um, but when it comes to deploying applications, it's not the best solution. Um, so the statement, the problem statement, what I'm here to talk about and try to solve is that when you build your applications on top of the facilities provided by your operating system, you could be locking yourself into an ecosystem that does not meet the needs of your application and or customers. And the solution is to build your applications to be independent of the underlying operating system and its packages. So what that would look like in practice is you have your kernel. Again, your library that interfaces with the system calls. Your user land utilities. And alongside your system packages, you have a set of packages that meet all the dependencies for your application. And then your application goes on top of the dependencies. And this can be duplicated so that you can have multiple instances of dependencies for your applications and deploy your applications on specific stacks just for, that, just for those particular applications. So some of the ways that this helps with uh, application delivery, release management, et cetera, is um, you get fully autonomous applications, meaning that you can upgrade your operating system and packages without worrying about, depend, without worrying about breaking dependencies for your applications. Um, this means that if you're on Ubuntu and you have to do an upgrade because of some security patch, you don't have to worry about going back and you know, reworking code to, meet, to, to work with the new dependencies or with the new um, stack. Um, you can create multiple application silos that contain conflicting libraries and tools. So if one application requires a particular version of, let's say, Libre SSL, and something else requires OpenSSL, you can install those right alongside each other, and they will not conflict because of the isolation uh, that you get from autonomous application setups. Uh, your deployments can be standardized across multiple operating systems. 
So a lot of the clients that I've worked with have a mandate to not have uh, more than 50% of any one distribution or operating system uh, be, not to have any one distribution operating system be more than 50% of their deployment. That means frequently working with SLES and Red Hat and FreeBSD and Ubuntu and HPUX and Solaris um, in some constellation uh, all at once. Taking the approach of building your dependency separately from your operating system means that you can deploy your application on any operating system with one set of configuration uh, and not have to worry about specialties and file paths uh, conflicting. Um, you can isolate the exposure to security flaws uh, in underlying libraries. Uh, that goes back to, again, uh, if there's some update that needs to happen, it can happen. Uh, whether it's in your application or on the operating system. So if your application uses a particular version of a library and, it, and you discover that there's a vulnerability, you can fix that in your application and not worry about it causing a problem with your operating system. Uh, the features of your application uh, can develop at your pace, not the pace of your operating system's package maintainer. So if you need new features, you can go out and get those new features implemented in your code and not have to wait for the next version of your OS. Um, and you still have access to all of your system packages. So what this approach really does is let you decide what the delineation is between a platform on your network and the application and its dependencies. And you can swap out the application, you can swap out the platform, it really doesn't matter because they're completely orthogonal to each other. One doesn't depend on the other. So um, I think that sounds great. Uh, let's presume that all of you are on board and you want to get started with that. There are several frameworks that come out of the box with the ability to let you do this on a POSIX system. POSIX again, I mean Linux, HPUX, Solaris, something like that. There's Package Source, which is part of the NetBSD project. Um, it's very similar to FreeBSD ports or any of the other BSDs ports uh, systems. Um, there's Open Package, which was started by a former FreeBSD contributor named Ralph S. Ingleshaw. Uh, he used to be the security or a security officer. Um, and he was also a founder of OpenSSL. Um, there's the Nix Package Manager. Uh, it's currently mostly Linux specific uh, and driven by the Nix, op, Nix, oh, Nixos uh, operating system. Um, I happen to prefer package source. It has more than 1700 packages available and includes all of the big things that people need in most deployments. Nginx, Varnish, uh, databases like Postgres, uh, just about everything that you would need. Um, it offers you the choice of binary or source builds. So uh, systems like Gen2, uh, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, by default, if you want to install a package, uh, frequently you navigate to some file path and then type make, wait for a while, you get your package, you type make install, and you're off and running. If you don't have time for that, you can do binary builds of your packages and pre-stage them uh, and use something simple to install analogous to a yum install or uh, an apt install. Um, it's really easy to set up. Uh, the multiple prefixes are what allow you to set up the application silos. So uh, a quick example is that I had a client who had several Ruby on Rails applications that they needed to install. And many of them required different versions of Ruby to run. Um, they were all deployed on one machine using package source with a different prefix defined for every uh, application that needed to be run. Um, a prefix is basically a path for the dependencies and you can have as many as you need. Um, it's a simple straightforward process to package your own applications. So when I was talking before about how you might deploy your applications using a tarball or a makefile, um, if you package your applications in the package source format, you can have something like Salt, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, etc. go out to a box and install your application as a package. 
which also lets you be able to do rollbacks seamlessly um, and upgrades seamlessly. Um, it's easy to fork the repository and add dependencies that you need. So when you check out package source, uh, it comes with, you know, 1,700 plus packages, but if there's something that you want that's not in there, you can add it very easily. Um, and it has unprivileged operation, meaning that you can deploy package source for a given user and let that user manage its own dependencies for an application stack, and you can do that for multiple users, and they'll never conflict. Uh, package source is also portable. Uh, gets its whole own slide uh, for portability. Um, I don't know if anybody in here has run, show of hands, has anyone run more than two of these? <laughs> okay, so, okay, three people, great. Um, so daily, uh, I tend to work with at least three of these and having a uh, package source set up with autonomous deploys or deployments means that um, there's much less gnashing of teeth uh, when it's time to do deployments. Um, okay, so what does it look like? Um, this is what it takes to get going with uh, a very basic installation of package source. Um, by that I mean you pull the source code down, that's what the git clone does, uh, you then change into the directory that's created and then go into bootstrap. You run a bootstrap script, it takes about 15 minutes, um, and then you're all set to go. Then you can CD into a uh, application path, package source development cache in this instance, uh, and then type make install clean. What that will do is build the package, it will install the package, and then uh, it will clean up all of the temp files that were created as a result. Um, and you can do that for every single uh, part of your application stack. So the idea, again, is to decide what you need for a system to be on your network and then decide what you need for your application to be able to be installed and treat the two as completely separate. Um, and here, uh, the package source devel memcached, uh, when you do the install there, it will install to the prefix that, that's defined in the environment. So if I needed memcache installed five different times, I could, I could rerun this command five different times with a different prefix and have different separate installations that I could then run uh, in parallel as peers. Um, so uh, can someone name a, uh, like a runtime or language uh, that they use to, de to, to deploy applications to? Something like Python, JavaScript, anything? I'm sorry? So use Capistrano for actually doing the deployments? Okay. Um, are you, use, are you uh, deploying Ruby apps? Okay. So, um, do you ever have uh, problems with uh, gem versions? Okay. So with a setup like this, you would do the bootstrap, you'd go in, uh, build Ruby, then build Capistrano for, on another system you could build Capistrano to do the uh, actual deployments. For those who don't know, Capistrano is simply a tool that goes out and uh, it lets you use Ruby code to specify a set of things to happen on a remote server. Um, similar in some respects to tools like Ansible, except that it's not, uh, it's, it's imperative, meaning that you actually have to do every step very much like a shell script. Um, so you would have your Ruby script, uh, or I'm sorry, you, you build Ruby as your application dependency, and all of the gems that come along with it would also be part of that dependency bundle and you would have a definition in Capistrano to say this is what's required for my application, including Ruby, every single gem, and then deploy that. When you needed to upgrade, you would simply uh, redefine the versions of the packages required for that, rerun your Capistrano script, and then you'd have an upgrade that doesn't care 
what version of Ruby is required by utilities in your system. So uh, I'm trying to think of a good Ruby utility that, that's commonly installed, uh, but, and I can't. Um, but in a situation like this, your application is completely safe from any changes that happen with the operating system packages uh, using Capistrano. Um, So I ended up burning through my slides pretty quickly. Um, I will now take questions if anybody has any. No question? Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask uh, how does this stack up against uh, me just pushing my uh, and my my application into a container like uh, why 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 will i not uh, go with a docker container put all my dependencies in it and ship it everywhere instead of using the the the, the, the what wh one of the tools that you just mentioned great question uh and thank you for asking it um so how does this compare to containers uh basically one, uh, containers exist on, well, if you're talking about Docker containers or LXC type containers, then only on one platform, Linux. Uh, there are different distributions, so you can have Red Hat or Ubuntu or Gentoo or whatever, uh, but it's still one platform. Uh, the clients that I work with can't have just one platform, so they need a solution that works on multiple things, uh, Solaris, uh, FreeBSD, et cetera. This is a solution that works on those. And um, okay, because I'm known as a as a strong advocate for BSD systems, sometimes people th think that I'm maligning uh, other platforms, and I'm not. The fact of the matter is that uh, containers frequently hang in ominous ways. Uh, you don't have to worry about weird, unrecoverable hangs with a system like this. Um, it's very lightweight, straightforward. If you need if you need network level isolation, then it gets a little bit tricky. So containers may work for you there. Um, or if you're in uh, an environment where you have access to more robust container systems like zones on Solaris uh, or jails on FreeBSD, um, then there's you know kind of an administrative overhead trade-off. Like, would you rather manage containers or manage uh, like the, the just the application dependencies. Um, so that, 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 that's basically the difference and trade off there. Thanks. Sure thing. Hey, hi. Hello. So uh, my question is regarding, let's say, for example, when I upgrade my OS, and let's suppose the TLS package has been upgraded, but then my code and my web server and everything is all of a sudden breaking. Now, if I use packet source and install the previous version, then what's the point of sort of upgrading or having the newest security update in the first place? Then this is sort of like, is this more of a temporary fix that we do so that things are in production and then we try to make it more compatible to the newer TLS libraries or something like that? Um, you know, I'm sorry, I lost you at the end there. You said, is this more... Like, for example, if we if the OS has come up with the new TLS library, right? And if we use packet source to have the previous TLS, TLS library, which is more compatible with my web server for now, then I can still have everything in production and nothing would break, right? Yes. Now, in that case, what's the point of upgrading the OS in the first case? Then is packet source only for a temporary measure? Or mm. what do you Let's recommend? See. OK, so if I understand your question correctly, you're saying that if I can uh, handle all of my application dependencies without touching the operating system, what's the point in ever upgrading the operating system? Um, well, no. I want to upgrade the operating system okay. so that I can have the latest TLS package, right? Mm -hmm. And But if I'm going to go reverse compatible and install the previous TLS uh, package using packet source, then what's the point? Then is oh. this a temporary measure? Like we use packet source as a temporary measure so that everything is working fine. And once we resolve all the issues, then we just knock this off completely. Gotcha. OK. Um, so <sighs> package source in this case would not be a temporary measure. It's the way you build your application stack, right? So um, from whatever layer forward, and that's something that's you know, that needs to be decided by a, a, a dev or engineering team um, saying that, okay, we have 
I don't know, Java, right? Let's say it's uh, OpenJDK 1.8. Uh, everything from that point forward is part of our application stack. Um, you, you may need to do rollbacks, but that's related to your application, not to your operating system. And so you would need to start thinking about this division between the platform and the app. Um, you know, what needs to happen in one doesn't need to happen in the other. Uh, and it's not that you are using one as a short-term fix, it's just the way that things are from that point forward. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it sort of does. Uh, but yeah, again, what happens is that each application has like hundreds of dependencies. Let's say, for example, if I have a Node application and it has Bcrypt, and Bcrypt relies on these browser packages which come along, mm -hmm. right? And then if I upgraded the browser, then now everything starts to break. So I don't have to just fix my code, but I'll have to probably dig into my dependency, that is the Bcrypt library, and then modify it so it's good to pick the right version of the package that it needs. So yeah, of course, I, it answers the question, but it's just uh, it's a lot of work around as well. Oh, I see. So, so you're talking about the administrative overhead of having package source packages. Yeah, going forward, yes. Updates. Yes. So um, that's a concern, uh, just as uh, it is with containers, right? So if you have a containerized system, um, which, by the way, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned before with containers, uh, there's, there's one additional consideration with containers in that uh, many people get prepackaged containers. And there were recent audits of many prepackaged containers, and something like 70x percent of them had uh, really egregious security flaws in them. Um, and these, not like an app uh, had like a buffer overflow in it, but like bad configuration that like a systems engineer would like never do. Um, but uh, yes, the, you then have at least two sets of packages to maintain, right? Your operating system packages and the packages related to your uh, application. But again, it's really easy to manage package source repositories. Um, you, have ups, you have things coming from upstream from the NetBSD project. Uh, you also have, and there are many contributors to that. So Joyent uh, that happens to run a huge cloud platform, they're active contributors to the, to the package source uh, project. Um, so it gets a lot of updates you know, like fairly quickly, and if you need to go out and do something on your own, it's really easy to do. But yes, you're right, there, there is administrative overhead there. Uh, I think it's worth the trade-off. It may not be if you're always deploying to one platform. Yes. I'm sorry, I lost you at the get at the end there. Oh, resource isolation. Um, yeah, package source does not do that. Uh, it's it's um, simply a way for you to install dependencies uh, for your application and um, anything that you need beyond that. You have to have uh, either a user-led facility to do it, um, like something that comes with daemon tools or run it um, that does that, or uh, use an operating system facility like Capsicum or Jails or Zones or some other thing like that. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Great question. So uh, the question to restate it is uh, how do you deal with um, building multiple packages and in particular uh, the conflicts that can happen with tools like SSL or others where uh, your application may require one and the operating system 
requires another, and frequently they don't play together nicely. Uh, and can package source handle that? And the, answer, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, very easily in 99% of the cases. There are some edge cases where uh, simply having file system and path isolation for your libraries or your applications isn't enough. And in those cases, you might need to go to a container solution um, like Solaris Zones or FreeBSD jails. Or Linux containers. Um, but in most cases with something like uh, SSL, the version that's installed by your operating system is usually not an issue for anything that's an application installed separately from the packages for your operating system. So if you install package source, you install LibreSSL or OpenSSL or BoringSSL or whatever for your application and you install your application in the same prefix, it will use those libraries and not conflict at all with the system SSL libraries. The same goes for 99% of the other libraries out there. Um, there was a problem a while ago with Postgres, uh, but that's been resolved and I'm not aware of any others that exist. So the uh, question was, does package source support reproducible builds? Um, and yes, uh, for m most of the packages. I, I'm not sure that they've gotten through all of them, but reproducible builds has been uh, like a goal for package source for a while. They've made really good progress on it. Uh, I know that on NetBSD, uh, Illumos, um, I think FreeBSD, uh, more than half of them can compile with uh, reproducible builds. Which brings me to uh, building multiple packages in general. Uh, if you're going to build a repository for your packages uh, so that you can do you know, a very simple install similar to an apt install or a yum install, um, uh, there is a distributed package builder that comes along with package source. Actually, there are three of them. Uh, th there's one that's official though, that will build every application that you specify. Uh, in an isolated environment and you can tweak the parameters for that. So if you need reproducible builds, that's where you would go and do it. Tell it the list of packages that you want to have built and it will kick off a distributed build for that. Uh, even if distributed means local to one host uh, using multiple cores. And um, then it will produce an index file that your package manager can use. The package manager is called pkgn. Um, and you can install from there without needing to compile every single time. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>